Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to the Carpenter's House Virtual Bible Study, Wednesday in the Word. Amen. We greet you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Good to have you with us tonight. Blessing to be in your home or wherever you may be with your phone, your computer, or your device. Thank you, Lord. It's time to go into the Word of God for the Wednesday Bible study. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We're going to be in the book of the Gospel of John, chapter 14. John 14. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're continuing our series out of John 14, the God who comforts and cares. And the purpose of this teaching is to remind us that even though we're going through these most difficult times. Today, God is yet the God and that the only God who comforts and cares for his people. And we find the answers to these and all problems by turning to the scriptures, the word of God. Amen. So let's pick up in John 14. Let's begin reading at verse 10. Verse 10 of John 14. And Jesus is speaking here. And he says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Amen. Amen. And may the Lord bless the reading, the hearing, and now the teaching of his word. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this blessed time that we have to spend in your word. Lord, make this time fruitful. Bless the message, the messenger, as well as the hearers of the message. And we thank you, Lord. We give your name all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, the sub theme that I've been using is comfort in Jesus. Comfort in Jesus. Now, whether a person acknowledges it or not, we all need comfort and assurance. Every person needs comfort and assurance, no matter how confident a person may feel or how rough or how tough they may appear to be. We all need comfort and assurance in something or someone. Well, that someone is Jesus, okay? Uh, but that's why we're studying John uh, 14 right now. And this entire 14th chapter of John is about comfort and assurance. And it's from the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, last week we looked at various passages of Scripture here in the Gospel of John where Jesus makes 
exclusive statements or claims that draw the lines of demarcation in the sands of religion whereby Jesus sets himself apart from all others claiming to be somebody. And I just made a list here of the, the, these are my top 10 for today, okay? Um, uh, Gautama Buddha, who is the founder of Buddhism. These are individuals claiming to be somebody, particularly in religion. Uh, Muhammad, the founder of Islam. Confucius, the founder of Confucianism. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Confucianism. It, Confucianism will only lead to Confucianism. Amen. Jim Jones. Jim Jones. He's the cult leader of, was the cult leader of the People's Temple Church. Started out in Indiana back in the 1950s. Uh, he led the mass murder suicide mission in Jonestown, Guyana uh, on November the 18th, 1978. 918 people died. 304 of those people were under the age of 18. Astounding. And fewer than 100 survived. They all died by drinking a, a cyanide-laced fruit juice. And it's amazing, Jim Jones himself died of a gunshot wound. He wouldn't even drink the stuff, okay? Moving on, David Koresh, he's the cult leader of the Branch Davidians. And uh, we know back uh, in the late 90s, uh, he led a cult that was in Waco, Texas, and uh, it ended up the facility that he and all of his followers were in. Uh, that facility caught on fire while they were in there, and uh, it was surrounded by authorities and the fire department, and, um, and uh, it went up in flames and such. So we have the um, acronym. It was in the city of Waco, and I uh, heard someone term it, we ain't coming out. Okay. Um, Charles Taze Russell, founder, uh, he founded the Bible Student Movement, which morphed into what we know today as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, also known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Number seven, Joseph Smith. He's the founder of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormons. Mary Baker Eddy. She is the founder of the Church of Christ Scientist, founded in New England back in 1879. And uh, which is not to be confused with Scientology, whose founder is L. Ron Hubbard. And uh, that's the cult that the famous actor Tom Cruise is a member and many other famous Hollywood actors and actresses and many Californians follow that uh, religion and to close out my top 10 list for today, number 10, Osho, AKA Roshnish, and also known as Bhagwan Sri Roshnish, uh, an Indian guru, God man, that's with a little g, a mystic, founder of the Roshnish movement. Uh, he was born under a different name uh, in 1931, Bhagwan Sri Roshnish Osho, these are names that he gave himself. Uh, he attracted thousands of followers. 
uh, before being exiled out of India and moved his quote unquote free love cult to America, bought a ranch in Oregon, amassed over 90 Rolls Royces and millions of dollars. He was a very educated man. He had a master's degree in psychology and uh, he was known as um, a guru for uh, physical relations. And in 1985, he was arrested for immigration fraud. And after pleading guilty, was deported back to India. Died on, uh, died in 1990 uh, in Pune, India. And there are more gurus and false prophets to come, particularly the Antichrist. And mind you, none of these cult religious leaders or their religions can give you or I the comfort and assurance that can only come from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Amen. The peace that is received from all those other religions and gurus and false prophets, that is a temporary peace. But the peace that Jesus gives is eternal, it is blessed, and it never fails. It never fails. Amen. And by even quoting that scripture, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself because that comes out of verse 27 of John 14. Now, uh, praise the Lord. Let's go uh, into John 14. And we talked last week on all these different claims of Jesus out of various passages of scripture. And uh, we talked about how Jesus claimed uh, that whoever drinks of the water that he gives, uh, they will never thirst again. And uh, they, that it would be a well of water springing forth out of them into everlasting life. Uh, Jesus claimed to be the uh, Messiah in John chapter four to the woman at the well. Uh, he claimed equality with God the Father in John 5, verses 17 and 18. He said, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. And then the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Jesus also claimed in John 5 the power to raise the dead. He claimed exclusive knowledge and relationship with the Heavenly Father in John chapter 8, verse 19. They said to Jesus, Where is your Father? And Jesus said, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And then in John 8, 24, Jesus claimed that those unbelieving Jews would die in their sins if they did not believe that I am, that he was the I am, the great I am from Exodus 3.14. Jesus claimed uh, freedom comes only by abiding in his word. John 8, 31 and 32, very uh, familiar verses to us. Uh, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth 
and the truth shall make you free. 36 said, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Then we had the claim again of Jesus to be the great I am, the Yahweh, eternal God, almighty, uh, creator of heaven and earth. Uh, when he said to the Jews, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. And then we go to our passage, our main text, John 14. And this is a major point in the lesson, assurance from the Son of God of who he is. John 14 and 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Therefore, Jesus is making the exclusive claim to be the only way to get to God the Father and the only way to get to heaven. And the last major claim that we've already discussed in our lesson is more assurance or should we say reassurance from the Son of God, the reassurance that his disciples, if they have seen him, they've seen the Father. Jesus said in verse 9, have I been so long with you, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Because in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, we see that Jesus is, quote, the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. As Hebrews 1 and 3 and then Colossians 1 15 tells us, he, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Therefore, Jesus fulfilled one of the grand purposes for him coming to earth, and that is to reveal God the Father to mankind. Amen. Now we look at another claim of Jesus from John 14 tonight, which gives us even more uh, assurance or reassurance, and that is the assurance of greater works. The assurance of greater works. Uh, in verse 10, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Verse 10, Jesus said, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? In other words, although I am an ordinary human according to the flesh. I'm not an ordinary person according to my inner man. My inner man is completely divine. And you see, and that's what separates Christ from all mankind and even from Christians, because even though we've been given a new nature when we're born again, which we can very well say a divine nature, yet we still possess the old nature. However, the old nature is to be crucified or mortified. But that is only done when the will allows the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to take full control. Amen. Because even a born again, Spirit filled believer can backslide. A born-again, spirit-filled believer can sin. Now, he, won't, he or she won't be comfortable in sin, but he or she can do it. And the truth of the matter is, we all do it. 
knowingly or unknowingly, we all sin. But there's a difference between committing a sin and practicing sin. The unbeliever practices sin. The unbeliever lives a life, a lifestyle of habitual sin. And the key is they have no, no remorse. They have no Holy Spirit conviction for the most part until God is ready to save somebody. And that's where the verse uh, comes in in John 16 that said, and when he has come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin. Amen. And, and that's what the Holy Spirit does when a person is coming to Christ. We get convicted of sin. And the Holy Spirit leads us all the way to Christ. Amen. And then it's also a work of the Spirit in regeneration, whereby we are born again, and then filled with his Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Jesus separates himself. He is separated from all mankind because he was born with the divine nature. You and I were born in sin according to to Psalm 51, shaped in iniquity. Amen. All right. So Jesus says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Thank you, Lord. Jesus could make this claim from birth. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Amen. So everything Jesus did, it was the Father doing it through him, which is the same to say that everything that you and I do as believers, I'm talking about the good works, okay? Because the Lord ain't taking no credit for no bad works, all right? But all the good things that we do, all the holy things, the righteous things that we do, it ain't us doing it. It's Christ in us the hope of glory. So Christ is doing the works through us just like the Father was doing the works through Christ. Amen. And that's what he's trying to get his disciples to believe and understand that he is in the Father, the Father is in him, and the Father who dwells in him does the works. Amen. He says in verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Amen. Jesus saying, look, if you don't believe everything I'm telling you about, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, he's doing the works. Listen, Jesus is saying, look at what I've done. Look at my works. What are Jesus' works? Well, how about healings? 
Did not Jesus go forth healing? Listen, Jesus healed so many people, it would be impossible to record all the healings that Jesus did. Just think about that for a second. That, that's a mind blower in and of itself. That Jesus healed so many people, it would be literally impossible to write down all the healings. Jesus performed so many miracles. He did so many, and listen, Jesus did no miracles until he was water baptized, spirit baptized, and not until after his temptation in the wilderness. And then Jesus entered his ministry. The water baptism was the first step of beginning his ministry, but he did no miracles until after the 40 days and nights of temptation in the wilderness. But then after that, the very first miracle Jesus performs is at a wedding. He and his disciples are invited to the wedding. Uh, many historians, Bible scholars believe that the wedding was uh, his cousin, John, who is the brother of James. James and John, who are called, he nicknamed them the Sons of Thunder. It's believed that it was at his wedding. And it's very clear that his mother, Jesus' mother, Mary, had a significant role at that wedding. Because when they ran out of wine, she went straight to Jesus. And she let him know, we are out of wine. Some really think she played the role of the wedding planner of this wedding. And she said to Jesus, we're out of wine. And his response was, well, what does that have to do with me? It's not my time yet. That was his response. It was a respectful response, okay? Please don't take Jesus out of context. Because when you read the passage, let me, let me just go there. It's John chapter 2. John 2. And when they ran out of wine, verse 3, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Amen. So the fact that Jesus said, woman, in our day, that would kind of look a little off color. It would look a bit disrespectful in our day. But in Jesus' day, it was almost like saying, ma'am. And look at the faith of Mary. Mary says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Amen. They go Nike right there. All right. So Mary is the one that coined that phrase, not Nike. All right. Well, they do say just do it. But watch this. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, 
fill the water pots with water. That's all he said. Fill the water pots with water. They filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. Notice there is no time delay after they filled up these water pots. And keep in mind, each water pot could fill up to 30 gallons of water. And there are six of them. And so when they filled them up to the brim, he said to them, draw some out now, take it to the master of the feast, and they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. He said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. In other words, the wine that Jesus made was better than the wine that they had already drunk and ran out of. Amen. Because Jesus is God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And he is the master chef. Hallelujah. Jesus don't even need cooking utensils to create something in the kitchen. Amen. And he made this wine perfect in a moment of time. Six barrels. 30 gallons each. And the master of the feast could not believe his taste buds. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen. Amen. Jesus can take the water of your life and mine and turn it into the best wine. Amen. Praise God. So that's Jesus' first miracle. And what an awesome miracle it is. And not to mention, as, I, as we said, the healings, the signs, the wonders, the casting out of demons, and not to mention the authority by which he spake. Jesus spoke with an authority that no man had ever spoke because he's God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So Jesus is saying over here in John 14, look, if you don't believe what I'm telling you about who I am and who's in me, and who I'm in, and who's doing the work, believe for the sake of the works. And may I remind us at the end of the Gospel of John, chapter 21, the last verse says this, there are also many other things that Jesus did works, okay, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. 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 Now, if you if you see through scripture, the works of Jesus, and you still don't believe, that's because you got a hard heart. 
your heart is hard. That's why. Let's move on. Verse 12, back in John 14. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. Thank you, Lord. Now this is a very interesting verse here. Jesus says, whoever believes in him, the works that he does, that believer will do also. And then he says, greater works than these will he do because I go to my father. Now, here's what we need to make a note of. Jesus did not say better works will he do or more amazing works will he do. He said greater works. This is not a reference so much to quality as it is quantity. Listen, nobody will ever be able to do better works than Jesus. That is works in more quality. But we will be able to do greater works that is in terms of quantity because he goes to the Father, Jesus will send the Holy Spirit. And that's why he says greater or that is more works will all believers do. Even though Jesus was God in the flesh, yet he was in the flesh. Not in the flesh in the sense that we use the term like the way Paul uses it in sin, but he was in human flesh, okay? But yet, because of that, he could not be omnipresent. Jesus, though he was God in the flesh, yet he could not be everywhere at the same time. And so that's why Jesus is showing us greater works than these that he's done will we do. Now imagine all the works that have been done since the day of Pentecost beginning with the apostles in the book of Acts and other believers like Philip the evangelist, okay, that went forth performing healings, miracles, signs, and wonders. Imagine how many works have been done since then and that was about 2,000 years ago. Amen. And Jesus has believers all over the world. Amen. He always has and he always will. And as these, as we, as his believers, as we go forth and we do good works, we allow God to use us to pray for people to minister his word, to minister encouragement, to lay hands on the sick. Everything we do, we are fulfilling this verse right here of greater works. Amen. Listen, that was not plan B. That was plan A. 
That was God's plan from the beginning of the ages. That one day, that's what that verse I quoted just a little while ago. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. It has always been the hope of heaven that Christ live in us. Amen. Nothing more beautiful than that. And by the way, we are the only people that can truly claim that the God we serve lives in us. He's not some external or exterior object or being that we worship or serve from afar. We serve a personal God. He knows us personally. We are in intimate relationship with him. He knows everything about us. And he wants us to know everything about him that he has revealed to us through his word. Amen. The Lord is looking for a close, intimate relationship with his people. Amen. Listen, you can't get intimate with these other false gods and through these false religions. It can't be done because there is no God but the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So... Right now, this is the day, this is the hour for greater works. Amen. As we yield ourselves to God in Christ through the Holy Spirit, the Lord uses us. And just like Jesus said, I am in the Father and the Father's in me and the works that I do, the Father is the one doing it. Well, Christ is in us, and he's in us by the Holy Spirit. And the works that we do are the works of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's doing the work through us by his own spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And here is the awesome part of it. On Judgment Day, he's going to reward us for the good works that we've done on his behalf. And he's the one that did it through us. But yet, we get the reward. Oh, my goodness. Amen. What an awesome God we serve. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. And then he goes on, which takes me to my next point. That was assurance of greater works. Now we see in verse, verses 13 and 14, assurance of answered prayer. Assurance of answered prayer. Jesus said, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask, anything in my name, I will do it. Wow. That's almost like a blank check. But it's not a blank check to do any and everything. It is a blank check to do all things through Christ. Amen. Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, that is, yes, we say in Jesus' name. And we are accustomed to praying, and when we get through praying, we say in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's not so much the words, but it's by the authority of, 
of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you ask anything in his name, and this was a game changer in this day, because up until that point, they just went straight to Jehovah God, okay? But here was the stipulation. They had to go through the priest. They had to go through the religious leaders. They had to go through the Levites, the priesthood. It was the priests that received from the people and offered it to God. Whether it was offerings, whether it was sacrifices, whether it was petitions, they received it from the people and then offered it to God. And only the high priest could go into the holiest of holies. Of course, those that have studied the tabernacle, you know that it was behind that veil. That's where the uh, ark of the covenant resided. The top of it had the angelic beings with the wings touching the cherubim. Inside of it was the tables of stone with the Ten Commandments, a piece of the showbread, and it never molded. That was the miracle. Wow. There was a there was a piece of showbread in that ark that never molded, and Aaron's rod that budded. In other words, it was a rod that was budded. It had flowers on it. But it, what we know that if you cut a rose off of the plant, eventually it's going to die. But that ark represented the presence of the living God. And anything in God's presence lives. Amen. 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 And the high priest could only go behind that veil into the Holy of Holies once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, to offer the blood on the mercy seat for the sins of the people. But glory to God. Look what the writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10. He says, in verse 9, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. That's a, really a quote from the Messiah. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. He's talking about the covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. He took away the first, that is the old covenant, the first covenant, that he may establish the second covenant, the new covenant covenant okay verse 10 by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all in other words Jesus don't have to die again and again amen when we are sanctified through his offering that is the offering of his body that he sacrificed on the cross that was a once for all sacrifice. It never has to be done ever again. 
unlike the animal sacrifices from the Old Testament that had, be, that had to be done over and over and over, year after year after year, the high priest would have to sacrifice a spotless lamb and bring that blood into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle it on the mercy seat for the forgiveness of his sins and the sins of the whole nation of Israel. But now, because of the body of Jesus, his sacrifice takes care of sins once and for all. Look at verse 11. It says, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Wow, that, that is a powerful verse right there. For by one offering, his offering of himself on the cross, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Even though we are being sanctified, we are in the process of being sanctified. That is made more like Jesus day by day, growing in grace from one level of grace to another level of grace. Yet, we are forever perfected in Christ. Thank you, Lord. That's why you don't lose your salvation. How can you lose your salvation when in salvation, because of Jesus' sacrifice, you have been perfected forever? See, the, 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 the word forever cancels out losing at any time. Oh, y'all ain't going to talk back to me. That's all right. Amen. Verse 15, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Amen. 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 Listen, when you get saved, your sins, past, present, and future, the Lord has said, I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, and we're almost done. I'm about to close. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Glory to God. So look what this is saying. We now, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we now, everybody, all believers, every Christian, I'm talking to true Christians now, every born again believer now has boldness to enter the holiest by the 
blood of Jesus. You see, because Jesus shed his blood on the cross, we now have access to God. Thank you, Jesus. Romans 5 and 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something about peace. You have to have peace with God before you can have the peace of God. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Amen. Listen, you can't put the cart before the horse. You cannot not be a believer or not be a Christian and receive the peace of Jesus. It can happen. It can happen. No more, no more than you or I can receive the benefits of working for a particular company and you don't work for that company. How can you and I receive the benefits of, of Apple or IBM or, 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 or McDonald's or any other establishment? How can we receive the benefits of that company and we're not employees of that company? It ain't happening. And so it is with the peace of Jesus. If you are not a true, I mean a, a genuine, authentic, born-again believer, you can't receive his peace. Because you, there is yet wrath between you and God because of sin. God hates sin. The prophet Isaiah said, it is your sin that separates you from your God. Sin separates us from God. But until you receive the free gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And you trust in the work that Jesus did on the cross. Once you do that, once you believe that Jesus died for your sins personally, personally, Listen, this salvation is an individual act. I can't get saved for you. You can't be saved for me. The pastor can't save you. The bishop can't save you. Mama can't save you. Can't nobody save you but Jesus. And you've got to come on his terms. And what are his terms? Let me tell you, they are not grievous. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen. Paul said that to the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. He said it again in Romans chapter 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Amen. Amen. You see, the sacrifice, the work that Jesus did on the cross makes it possible for you and I to go into the holiest of holies by the blood of Jesus. Amen. And the purpose of going into the holy of holies is to have fellowship with God. Amen. That's what it's about. It's about a relationship. This is what Jesus provided for you and for me. Amen. Remember, the Bible said in Matthew 27 that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil that separated the holies from the holy of holies, that veil ripped in two from the top to the bottom. And that veil was some four to six inches thick. We ain't 
talking about no, no shower curtain or no drape hanging on your window. We are talking about a very uncommon type of veil. It was a most thick veil. Four to six. I didn't say four to six inches high. I said four to six inches thick. And when Jesus died on that cross, perhaps when he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Listen, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus was forsaken that you and I might be saved. Thank you, Lord. He was forsaken that we might be found. And Jesus was willing to be forsaken. But don't think it was easy. That's why he cried out the way he did. But the scripture tells us the veil was ripped and notice from the top to the bottom. Why is that? Because God, the Father himself, ripped it. And by ripping the veil, he allowed access to his divine presence for all who believe. Thank you, Jesus. And so that's why Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name by my authority, because what I did on the cross allows you me for anything. Listen, and it can be anything as long as it is within the bounds of his will. Amen. If it's in the bounds of his will, right. he will do it. Thank you. And we're going to talk more about that next week. I thank you for tuning in today. I pray something was said to help you, to encourage you, to strengthen your heart. I want to pray with you right now. If there's anybody that needs to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen, the Bible says make your call and election sure. Listen, if I ask you the question, are you saved? Only a solid, confident yes will do. No other answer is sufficient. You can't answer that question by saying, well, I pray, or I go to church, I read the Bible, I think I am. Oh, no, listen, listen, no, no. You need to know that you know that you know that you know that you are saved. The word of God says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, believe, don't guess, don't be a hoping and a wishing and a praying, but believe. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for the sins of the world, particularly your personal sins, then you shall be saved. So say this simple prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, come on, that's right. Bow your head right where you are. Just say, Lord Jesus. I am a sinner. I need to be saved. Save me, Lord. Come into my heart. Make me born again. 
I repent of my sins. I turn away from my old life. And now I walk in the new life, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, giving me eternal life, and giving me abundant life in this life that I may live for you and bring your name glory and honor. I give your name the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pray that you pray that prayer with all sincerity. And listen, the Lord backs his word. The Spirit of God will bear witness with your spirit that you are born again. You are a believer, a child of God. Listen, read God's word every day. Pray to God. Talk to him every day, all day long. Maintain open communication with the Lord. Amen. That's the whole reason he lives on the inside. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And surround yourself with people that love God and people that know his word. So you can learn his word and grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. Listen, if the Lord puts it on your heart to give, you can cash app us at dollar sign TCH give. Or you can uh, give from the website, tchchurch.org. Or you can text the word TCH give to the number 77977. Amen. We love you. Keep us in prayer as we are keeping you in prayer. And we will see you Sunday morning in the Sunday morning live worship service. Until then. Continue to worship him and give God all the glory. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.